Welcome everyone to the seven generation focus building special programming. For youth empowerment session, this is our first of three sessions in the reclaiming our future indigenizing strategic planning for to address social determinants of health community of learning. And in this session, our presenters from the Native American Youth and Family Center in Portland, Oregon, will share strategic planning best practices on building special programming for youth empowerment. And uh, my name is Sabu Kuyumjin. I am the pub uh, am a public health associate at the Technical Assistance and Research Center at the National Council of Urban Indian Health, or NAKUI for short. Joining me from Nukui uh, includes uh, Molly Siegel, another public health associate and my colleague at Nukui, uh, Liz Beth, uh, our technical assistance uh, project uh, manager, and Rachel Diao, our communications associate. We are honored to have you all here today. We kindly ask that you place your name, organization, tribal affiliation, into and title into the chat box. In addition, we welcome any feedback you would like to provide about our webinar, about your webinar experience uh, in a survey that is posted in the chat box as well. Next slide, please. Uh, just to let everyone know that there is, uh, we have upcoming community learnings uh, sessions after today, uh, which is on November 9th and January 20th, and more information will be provided in, uh, in today's session on how to register. Next slide, please. For those who are unfamiliar with Nukui, here is a little background. The National Council of Urban Indian Health also known as NAKUI, is the national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indian and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. NAKUI is the only national representative of 41 Title V Urban Indian Organizations, or UIOs, under the Indian Health Service in the Indian Health Service Improvement Act. Nukui strives to improve the health of over 70% of American Indian Alaska Natives that live in urban areas supported by quality accessible health centers. Next slide, please. As a reminder, this session uh, is being recorded. All mics have been muted upon entry. Uh, we encourage participation and encouragement in today's session. And uh, for those who are joining, please, uh, and are un unmuted, please mute yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, we invite you all uh, to participate by turning on your cameras, uh, posting questions, comments in the chat box. There will be opportunities to participate today uh, in our, at the end of our part, present, our presenters' uh, present presentation uh, using the Padlet, using a Padlet form and uh, during our Q&A sessions. If you uh, scan your phone or tablet uh, with the QR code currently seen there, uh, this is for you to leave uh, feedback for us on how we can improve future sessions and how you like this session today. Your participation is always, uh, is always uh, appreciated. So thank you so much. Next slide, please. This slide uh, features some information on how to use Zoom. Uh, for those uh, unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, and so you could just uh, go to the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can find the chat box feature, click and enter the chat. Uh, please enter the comments and questions there. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is, uh, you know, additionally, feel free to use I, uh, icons and emojis throughout today's session. Um, you know, we appreciate those 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 emojis. It does uh, 
bring a little more warmth to our uh, Zoom session. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this slide uh, features some information on how to use Padlet. And I, I mentioned earlier, there's going to be an activity after at the end of today's presentation where uh, y'all all will have access to that. A uh, link will be provided. And once uh, you get that link, you'll be directed to a website where there's some questions and activity that's going to be facilitated by our presenters. So uh, over there, when you're on the site, the way to comment is that you go to the question it's where and where it says add comment just type in your question and press enter and your as is shown in this slide uh, your your comment is is then uh, visual for everyone um, it is anonymous so you won't see like names and stuff to, to to in this regards here when you're interacting um next slide please and just like our Zoom, there is a uh, emoji option. Uh, so if you right click on uh, the area where it says add comment and press emoji, you get a whole bunch of different options of emojis you could use. So we encourage you to, if you'd like to use emojis here as well, please do so. Uh, and we'll come back to this uh, again. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as shown on this agenda, we will begin our presentation at 2.09 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that includes the activity. Uh, and then there will be a QA and a uh, session at 2.50, and we will end with an evaluation and upcoming events uh, and adjourning today's session at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Next slide. And our presenters uh, for the special programming for youth empowerment session uh, are Anna Castillon, Castillon and Becca Gerner. Anna is Chicana, whose family is from Los Volcanes in Jalisco, Mexico. Anna moved to Portland, Oregon in 2015 and, and attended Portland State University, where she received uh, degrees in political science, indigenous uh, nations and Native American studies. Anna is a career and readiness manager and provides cultural uh, specific programming and services to youth, to youth interested in obtaining a uh, high school diploma or GED, pursuing higher education, uh, including trade schools and providing skills and pathways for youth to obtain uh, living wage careers. Next slide. Becca Gurner is a citizen of the Vihajas Band of Kumeyaay Indians. She moved to Portland Northwest in 2020 from San Diego, California, where she lived her entire life up to that point, including 16 years on the reservation on her reservation on the reservation. Uh, moving uh, before moving, she worked with her tribe's education department for nearly a decade, mostly with K through 12 students and programming. And uh, she is, um, she works prior before her current position as, as a, a culture education and wellness manager. She was uh, a coordinator where she worked uh, and designed youth and re reconnected them to uh, help them with high school, getting their high school diplomas and GEDs. And so that's a little bit about Becca. And now I want to uh, welcome uh, Becca and uh, and Anna and on, Anna to uh, with some emojis in the chat box. So please give some heart emojis in the chat box and welcoming them to present. Uh, and thank you again. And the mic is all yours, uh, Anna and Becca. Hello, thank you everyone. So Sabu did our introduction, so Anna and I won't introduce ourselves again, but thank you all for joining us today. Let's kick things off with a, kick, a quick history of the Native American Youth and Family Center. So NEA was started in 1974 when parents and elders in Portland, Oregon came together and wanted more for their youth. 
They began meeting at the Urban Indian um, Center to address issues such as youth involvement in drugs, street gangs, and high school dropout rates. A, and a basketball team was formed, officially starting they as after-school programming. Originally called the Native American Youth Association, they operated from various locations throughout the city of Portland, truly from basements at universities to firehouses and office buildings. In 1994, NAYA became a 501c3 nonprofit. We are a multi-tribal, multicultural organiz organization serving self-identified Native Americans and Alaska Natives. We do not refuse services to anyone, but all of our program programs are built for the Native population with a Native lens. New slide, next slide. Oops, sorry, maybe not. Sorry, back one. <laughs> All right, so NAYA as an organization grew. Its staff, students, elders, and community members recognized this and held a retreat in 2003 where they worked tirelessly to identify the 10 core values to help guide our mission and ultimately our programming today. Um, we can move to the next slide. To the core value slide. right at the beginning. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties here. <laughs> Thanks for being flexible, everyone. You know, those who bend don't break, so. Sorry, usually once you get clicked out there, it's hard to get back on there. Okay, so we are, right, core value, okay. Um, I can't see. Okay. You just go to the little uh, sign that has a little presentation at the top. Um, okay. My thing is blocked. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. And there's also a little, little uh, sign at the very bottom, too, um, by notes that you were, where you could zoom in and out of the, the presentation. There's a little symbol right there. If you go closer to where the zoom is, mm -hmm. and it's like a present. No, it's on the other side of it. Sorry. Right there, yeah. There we go. So some of our core values are respect, balance, pride, giving, community, transit, uh, traditions, kindness, accountability, diversity, and leadership. And these are really the four of our programming. Um, but also Portland is home to the ninth largest urban indigenous population with NAYA impacting over 10,000 people annually and representing over 380 tribes. Our department that we work in, the Youth and Education Services Department, we serve about 2,000 people annually just within our own department. So our impact is quite large. Um, and as such, it's important for all of our programming to be intentional in its creation and its implementation. All right, next slide. So in 2006, Nea moved to its current location near Chokiku which is a traditional site to many tribes throughout the Pacific Northwest uh, to gather, trade, and build community. Since then, NAYA has expanded to include an alternative culturally focused high school called the Many Nations Academy, uh, offering as an agency family support services, elder programming, uh, which ultimately resulted in its name change to the Native American Youth and Family Center. Uh, next slide. Oh, back one if you can. Perfect. So from this site, NAYA administers affordable housing, economic development, programming, in addition to its culturally centered year-round educational programming. As a youth and family center, we recognize that if youth and the family are supported, 
then we are redefining colonial paradigms surrounding success, education, wellness, as well as creating a space for connection to culture to provide lasting positive impact for the next generation. So with that now, I'm going to pass it along to my colleague, Becca Gruner, to speak about their programming for youth in second through eighth grade. Next slide. NAYA's culture, education, and wellness programming is focused on youth in second through eighth grade, with some programming serving youth through 12th grade and other opportunities for families of youth to also participate. Staff includes our academic and enrichment coordinator, recreation coordinator, cultural arts coordinator, and culture education and wellness manager. These are long-standing positions that have been strategically funded all by grants, so our programs are sustainable. Now I'll briefly discuss each program. NAYA's After School Learning Center programming was built on NAYA's original foundation of serving our youth. Keeping that in mind, it is important that we have programming that will address the needs of our, that our community sees for our youth. Therefore, After School Learning Center encompasses academics such as homework support, skill building, like STEAM and literacy, as well as recreation, including sports and indigenous games, and cultural arts, which also involves storytelling and native language activities. When possible, we also team up with NAYA's other departments to offer culturally specific programming and wraparound services. For example, the week after Thanksgiving, our health equity team at NAYA will be doing interactive workshops on first foods with our youth. Camp Rise is our, is our spring break and summer program and has many of the same aspects as the After School Learning Center. But these do have a stronger focus on outdoor learning rather than school subject academics. Our recreation program serves youth through 12th grade. Volleyball and basketball are regular season sports in the fall, winter, and spring. There are also sports camps like baseball, soccer, and kayaking, and one-time events like family wiffle ball. Additionally, recreation also includes indigenous games, some examples of those include rock and fist, as well as bear and salmon. Last but not least is our cultural arts programming. While our cultural arts programming has a youth focus, this is something we ensure is accessible to families as well. A huge aspect is bringing in knowledge keepers and those who can and are willing to teach others. In order to make space for this, our cultural arts coordinator hosts culture nights twice monthly throughout the school year. Next slide. Okay, so hopefully you're saying this is all great, but what are some of those things that make your program successful and sustainable? So first, um, a focus on a safe and supportive environment. We want to ensure that our community feels like NAIA is a place they can come no matter what, and that everyone knows they are welcome. That can start with a simple greeting and welcome when you see someone. Building relationships and trust is also essential with our community. A lot of the time that happens slowly, but that is where consistent communication can really help. If the individual or family feels you care, it goes a long way in building those lasting relationships. Another really important aspect to our culture, education, and wellness programming is youth voice and choice. We ask youth what they want out of programming and work to ensure their voices are heard. This is often done by giving youth leadership roles, such as opportunities to lead activities. Additionally, we want youth to be engaged, but also ensure they are challenged. So we incorporate skill building activities, we hope to continue building that with a big focus on STEAM and literacy this year. Now, let's get real. We do not do all of this with our four-person culture education and wellness team. A major aspect is working with NAYA's wraparound services to offer our youth and families additional supports. We also work a lot with community partners to offer programming and services. The last thing I will touch on is culturally focused programming and supports. As I said earlier, all of NAYA's services are built for the Native community, so ensuring our programming is built with community voice is essential. Next slide. All right, and so for our youth in ninth grade through the age of 24, students can access College and Career Center, which focuses on engagement in the workforce, education, and post-secondary education success. 
And that kind of includes a few things, right? So college nights are our regular programming, which are on Tuesdays and Thursdays from four to six, where students can drop in after school to get assistance with homework, applications, scholarships, resumes, among other things that the student might request. Uh, so over a big thing is consistency, right? We want to make sure that our youth know that we're there for them and that we'll always be there for them. And so over the last five years, we haven't missed a single college night. Um, we have had over 520 college nights that have been held with youth attributing their, you know, awarding of prestigious internships and scholarships to this reliable and consistent programming. So another thing is ninth grade counts. It is a two week long summer program for youth entering the ninth grade to develop the tools and skills necessary to become college admissible by their senior year of high school. Students go on campus visits, participate in relationship building activities and complete self-reflective assignments to identify areas of potential growth and additional support that they might need for their first year of high school. Uh, promotion of self-advocacy and sense of self are paramount as we prepare our youth for this transition. Dually, we maintain strong relationships and partnerships with various school districts so that youth who participate in our summer programming can actually receive credit for the work that they put into the program. And then another thing is mentorship. So this is huge, right? Uh, mentorship occurs in all of our programming. We, well, it's so important that I can say almost everybody here at NEA does some form of mentorship. All of our staff are required to maintain consistent connection with you through email, phone, or text, and then providing regular check-ins as well. We know that youth are in transitionary points in their lives and can be overwhelmed or feel unsupported for a variety of reasons that might be attributed to home or peer relationships. So by consistently engaging and reminding youth that we are here, regardless if they reply to our emails or text messages, that consistency is key, uh, they are more likely to re-engage with staff once they feel ready. And then we also have strategic partnerships. We encourage our staff to engage with other organizations, universities, colleges, as well as attend conferences and community events to strengthen our programming. By leaning into our relationships with our partners, we can increase the impact of our efforts and funding, as well as develop reciprocal relationships with those partners. And next slide. So some of our funding best practices. Uh, we do a lot, clearly, <laughs> and it can be kind of daunting, right? So Naya accomplishes most of the programming through grant funding. Uh, so NAIA's programming is centered on core values, but is ultimately informed by community input, strategic problem solving, and guidance through the use of the relational worldview model. Uh, so using the College and Career Center as an example, the community expressed a need to support youth in becoming adults and transitioning to the workforce and accessing post-secondary education. So to do this, we broke it down to three community needs and centralize those services. So we have career services, college services, and re-engagement services. And next slide. So within these areas of service, we outlined broad goals we wanted our youth to achieve. So that included knowledge and hands-on experience of high paying jobs, and we accomplish this through partnerships with trade unions, um, you know, uh, site visits to like the carpentry union. <laughs> Getting those hands-on activities is really important. Uh, we also have youth admissibility and retention in post-secondary education. So having the student be able to envision themselves in that space is really important. So we are constantly taking youth on college in campus visits, um, some are overnight where they get to kind of live that college student life. And that's really important for a student to be able to envision themselves in that space. And then engagement in education and dismantling stigmatization of the GED is really important. Sometimes high school just doesn't work out for everybody and that's okay. The GED is just another way to get to where you're going, right? So kind of, Addressing that with youth and parents is really important and saying, hey, actually you might be able to accomplish your goals quicker 
uh, because high school doesn't seem to be working out and that's okay. So from there, we'll go on to the next slide. One more next slide. We got behind one. Yeah, thank you. And so we have strategically applied to grants that would sustain our goals for youth rather than fit our programming uh, to the grants objective. Through this model, we're, uh, we have sustained college, excuse me, a college preparation coach that focuses on youth ages 13 through 16. Uh, another college preparation coach that focuses on youth 16 through 24, a college success coach, which uh, follows youth through the first two years of college, uh, a youth career skills coach, uh, an education re-engagement coach that focuses on youth 14 through 21, on getting them re-engaged in either high school or choosing the GED route, an adult GED coach that kind of works with youth over 21, um, excuse me, young adults over 21 uh, and adults as well. And then a college and career readiness manager. So these are great examples of like ways that we were able to sustain, you know, our mission and our overall goal. But really a great example of this is actually the re-engagement program which Becca led the way in developing and sustaining. So I'm gonna pass it off to Becca. Thanks, Anna. Before I became NAIA's Culture Education and Wellness Manager, I was NAIA's Educational Engagement Coordinator. This was a brand new position that was made possible when a few of NAIA's staff, including Anna, applied for and were awarded Oregon's Youth Development Division's Re-Engagement Opportunity Grant. The need for this program came from our community letting us know that we had a gap in services. We didn't have options for those who were disengaged from education and had not received a high school diploma or equivalent. This led to the main goal of the program, to help youth get reconnected to education and earn their high school diploma or GED, while also ensuring to destigmatize the GED for our youth. Destigmatizing the GED was really important because many people do not realize a GED gives you the same opportunities like access to jobs, scholarships, and college. Since this was a brand new program at NAIA, building it with that goal in mind was the first step. It started with internal referrals from other NAIA staff, a grant partner in Mount Hood Community College for our GED services, and our on-site high school, Many Nations Academy, as a high school diploma option. We had four GED students start uh, Mount Hood Community College's GED classes about a month after I was hired. In order to get those youth enrolled in the program and started, I walked them through every step of the way. When they started school, I had regular weekly check-ins with them in addition to tutoring to help with assignment planning. Uh, while this worked for some youth, it didn't work for everyone. Three of the four youth had jobs that they worked at and didn't always feel like they could commit to having assignments due at the end of each week. This was when I really started to dig into other GED resources in our area and online that might have more flexible options. From there, three strong partners were established, leading to our first GED grad about four months after the program's launch and to four GED grads within the first year and three months, which was this June. This was our start, but I'd like to mention some of the other things that have helped the program be successful and grow. There are many barriers for our youth. I talked about the need for many of them to, to be working, uh, but when the grant was written, they also considered things like if you have a laptop or a Wi-Fi, or if they need childcare when at school or in tutoring. Funds for those things were built into the grant so that we could remove as many barriers as possible for our youth. I will briefly touch on a reoccurring theme you have heard both Anna and I discuss. Supporting youth by first building relationships is key, and as well as maintaining those relationships with consistent communication. And I discussed getting youth connected to education options, but getting them connected to other supports that our grant either doesn't fully fund has also been import important for retaining our youth. Uh, as far as um, we have connected youth um, with rental, utilities, basic needs support through other NAIA programs and through our community partners. 
being funded can be uh, being grant funded can be intimidating and there there is often a fear of losing funds and therefore programming. However, especially with culturally specific programming, it's important to communicate with funders and let them know when they are creating barriers for our community. This can really lead to change. I will wrap things up with how the formation of this program led to us applying for and being awarded another GED grant. About a year after the start of the re-engagement program, a grant became available for GED programming that had no age restrictions. We had several youth and adults who wanted to earn their GED when the re-engagement program launched, but were not eligible due to the grant's age restrictions of being no older than 21. Because we already had, had a successful model, it was really a no-brainer to apply for this grant. We were able to show examples of our successful model, which we believed help us secure the grant for the adult GED program that we'll be launching soon. Uh, next slide. Oh, that one was still there. Oh, next slide. <laughs> Okay, so I'll quickly pass it on to Sabu to review how the Padlet works again, and then Anna will kick off our activity. Thank you, Becca, and thank you, Anna, so far for just sharing all of this really amazing best practices and um, real life um, and knowledge to, that, to help our Urban Indian programs today who's, who are joining. Um, next slide, please. So, there will be, uh, this is an activity where you will be directed to another page, which we will eventually show up very shortly. But a way to go ahead and do this is taking your phone, your tablet, if you'd like, and taking, uh, putting the camera on it, and there'll be like a link that could directly direct you to this activity and some questions. Or uh, there, there is also a link that's going to be provided in the chat box. Uh, currently so that's also coming uh and so you could press on the link in the chat box as well and uh let us know that um let us know if you are, have any trouble getting into uh this padlet uh now we'll i'm going to pass uh the mic back to becca and anna anna and um and rachel and our communications lead is going to share the screen that you all will be seeing when you press uh, the link or have used the QR code. The mic's all yours, Becca and Anna. All right, thank you so much. So we previously mentioned the relational worldview model, but we really didn't go into it, right? So it's something that we, a tool we use all the time when working with youth and it becomes kind of uh, just second nature right, to use it. Although in the beginning, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, it, it can be kind of challenging, right, how to integrate it into your daily conversations with youth. But we also use this for um, conducting program assessments. So uh, there are four quadrants of the relational worldview model, uh, mind, body, spirit, and context. And in fact, in the Padlet, there is a PDF, if you're interested in reading more about it, really quick can Y'all put in the chat if you've heard of the relational worldview model. I'm just curious. This is me being nosed. Okay. And if you have no, yes, no. All right. So definitely click on the link, open it in a new tab, save it for later. Uh, it's quite a bit to read over and we don't have that kind of time but please do read over it, it is amazing. Um, it's a great tool to have, uh, especially if you are working with uh, folks or doing direct services. So like I said, there are four quadrants of the relational worldview model, mind, body, spirit, and context. And when utilizing this with youth, we use it to identify areas where the youth or the family may need support. And similarly, we do it for when we're not reaching our target outcomes, right? That sometimes happens and it's okay. We have to recognize it. Um, and we use this to kind of reevaluate our program design. And we're now inviting you all to do the same. So uh, we're gonna start off with the first one. And the first one is mind. So that is in pink or red. Um, and 
In what way does your organization or program engage your staff or participants intellectually? In what ways does it provide staff and participants with respite from societal trauma? And what are areas of success or, for your program or organization? And what are areas of improvement? So I invite you to kind of think about that. We're gonna give a minute or two um, before we jump into the next one. But you're able to add a comment. And again, it's all anonymous. So don't worry, don't get shy. Um, but type what might be something that you need to work on or how does your program currently um, provide you know, some intellectual stimulization uh, for your youth or adults that you serve. See those responses rolling in. We'll give you about 30 more seconds before we jump to the next one. Oh, I love the idea of an indigenous book club. That was really cool. Okay, thank you all for those contributions. Um, please check out everyone else's. Like, I'm definitely going to check these out after too, because I think we can all learn from each other. So, body is the second quadrant. In our organization, uh -huh. these are. These are things that are keeping you and your teams healthy, such as collaboration, team building, and boundaries with staff. Our question for this, for this quadrant is, in what ways does your program or organization support keeping you all healthy? This could be things like staff retreats, team um, or one-on-one -on -one meetings, and opportunities to get comfortable and build relationships with other staff. So again, we'll give you probably like about two minutes for this one, if you all can jump in. And that is the, I guess it's the color of that one is white. It's the body. Ooh, I love that getting out into nature. My office doesn't have a window, so I feel like that's, you know, that's important. Step outside every once in a while. But intentionally with the group, that's awesome. Yoga breaks. Sharing a meal. That's a big one for us, too. An employee wellness program. That's amazing. All right, it looks like maybe we'll jump right into the next one. Yeah, I think we're gonna need to plan our next staff meeting outside, um, <laughs> weather permitting, of course. And so the next one is spirit. So that one is in yellow. And 
it says, how is the program or organization's mission and values being promoted? And what ways are staff and participants being actively supported? And what are areas of success and opportunities for growth? So definitely let that one marinate a little bit. Um, and part of the relational worldview model is being in balance, right? So making sure your staff and your program like feel good and are in balance are really important. Um, yeah, I'll give it a minute or two. Oh, I like mental health days, those are important. It's also really important to recognize the ways that things aren't going well. And um, sometimes there's a sense of like bad and good, right? And sometimes things are what they are. Um, and being able to reflect on that is really important. So thank you for providing that feedback. And smudging, smudging, I love that. That's my favorite. Um, that's a, that's a really good way to like center yourself and also your staff. Becca, do you want to go off into the next one? Sure. So our last one is context. It's there in blue. And our questions are, in what ways is your program or organization supporting the target community? What mechanisms are in place for you for your community to provide feedback and how are you engaging them to provide it? Maybe you have targeted programs and supports or have monthly community input meetings, things like that. And just as with the last one, if you're finding like, maybe we're not doing this, um, mention that too, and think of ways that maybe you could. A weekly newsletter, awesome. An app, yes, apps, apps are great. You know, sometimes we try to do a lot of things through email, but a lot of things that are accessed through phone can sometimes be easier access. Roundtable discussions with families who regularly use programmings, awesome. Surveys, talking circles, forums, social media pages. Patient app for satisfaction feedbacks or visit feedback. Great, so that was another app. So it seems like apps are working for people. All right, so we know that this might not work for everyone, but it's just the way we do our programming, the way we check in with our youth. When we're doing this with youth, we have a general conversation, right? So we're asking, how are you feeling? Um, you know, what do you need? Those kind of things. And that kind of prompts the youth to share with us maybe what's going on. 
Um, maybe they're not doing well in school and their grades are suffering and we ask why. And it's not an accusatory thing like, oh, you're not doing your homework. It's more so of like, what's going on? Why can't you engage as a student? And we end up finding out reasons like maybe they're working a job to support their family and paying rent. Uh, maybe they're doing other things, right? Maybe they're just not feeling fulfilled. And in these ways that we're able to kind of look at the youth and assist them and provide those wraparound supports. And Becca and I both do that in our programming. And we look at that with our staff. Uh, we use this with our staff as well during our regular check-ins uh, to find out ways we can support our staff and ensure you know we can work efficiently as a team, right? Uh, and then again, with our programming, what ways does our programming support? Um, where are we failing and where are we succeeding? And what can we take from those failures and turn into a success? So Becca, do you have anything more to say about that? Nope, I don't think so. Just thank you all so much for participating. I know sometimes it's like, you know, technology, can I get it to work? But we really appreciate your responses. Um, I hope you had a chance to see others. I don't know if there's a way that this can be shared with participants, um, but we're okay with that if that's possible. And we had such a great time. Thank you. Yes, thank you all so much. Thank you. And this actually is a good time um, to uh, open up the floor uh, for folks who want have any questions for to for Becca and Anna, um, this is that time. If there's anything that uh, that came to your mind when the pre during the presentation or during the activity that you wanted to ask, um, please unmute your mics if you'd like. Uh, you could type in in the chat box uh, your question, but uh, please, uh, the the floor is now all to all participants who want to ask a question or comment. We love talking, so don't be shy. Good morning, um, this is Francie from Native Health. Phoenix, can you hear me? Um, well, I guess I just want to thank you for that presentation. It was really great. Um, and also, you know, I was wondering if you had maybe, uh, I don't know, a template or some kind of workflow for how you would deploy a program using the, the what is it called, the relational worldview model. So I did a paper on that in college um, and I kind of did like a little hypothetical um, um, program, but now, you know, that was so long ago, I'm wondering if maybe you guys could share how you would actually deploy a program or uh, a best practice using that model. You can also send it by email. Okay, I was going to say, we'll put our email and contact information in the chat for sure. Um, but we actually do have a few, we have relationships. So with Terry Cross, um, who, you know, is the person who really paved the way for that, for the relational worldview model. And we actually contracted with him and have uh, that as part of our regular uh, onboarding with our staff. Um, so whenever we receive a new staff, um, we have them meet with Terry Cross uh, and kind of go through the overview. We have videos as well. And then when it comes to program design, we are pretty intentional and we do have a worksheet that I'm not going to be able to find right now because it's in our many files, but I can definitely send it along and we can stay connected. That would be great. I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat. Thank you. And Becca, do you have anything else to add to that? 
Nope, I think just, um, I guess I do. <laughs> just with the relational worldview model, I think, especially when I was starting, I hadn't been introduced to the relational worldview model before. And I was getting really stuck on trying to like, although like the resources like Anna will send you, it might be really great to be like, okay, let's follow this step by step. But to also um, like keep those things at the forefront, but to not get stuck on like, okay, I need to do this little thing perfectly or by like these certain questions I need to ask these certain questions because a lot of a lot of it is um like natural it comes natural so it comes through the, the natural conversations with the youth the, with the youth and families and isn't something that you should like really sit down with like a paper and be like okay am I doing this conversation right um it just is something that after you're familiar with like the terminology and those things that it, it does come more naturally so that is something that I feel like took me a while to really get a grip on. So I just wanted to share that. And to Becca's point too, I will add that it's simply a snippet in time, right? So when you're having these conversations, you're recognizing that things within each quadrant may change. So um, whenever you're having that conversation or if you are putting pen to paper and evaluating a program or an idea for a program, um, that may change and you have to be okay with that, right? So what might have worked uh, right now might not work next week. And similarly with youth, um, if that's how they're feeling right now, 20 minutes might change, right? Um, and their sense of balance might change as well, but we'll definitely provide that material to you. Um, and yeah, other questions? Just a heads up, we will provide the material. We can't provide the videos. I'm just giving you a heads up on that, but we can provide the, the materials. Um, I did type up one question about, um, do you guys use any work plan templates or resources in helping with managing youth caseloads? Um, and if you do, would you be able to share those resources? Thank you. So we have a kind of tracking system. We use Effort to Outcomes or ETO. Um, and that's how we kind of really maintain our case notes, um, tracking outcomes, uh, impacts as well. So within that system, we use it across the agency and we're able to uh, really utilize our wraparound services in that way. So we can see case notes that a different department might have done. And in this way, we can recognize when a youth is being supported by others, but also where they might need additional supports. So it's kind of hard to explain without showing, right? Um, but the system captures all the information, which ultimately helps us in grant reporting. Um, Becca, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, just that it, we wouldn't really be able to share it. It is like an online database, and that is really where we keep it all. But um, just in case anyone's wondering, like, is an online database worth it? Um, it works for us. We do have someone who's like a data-specific person uh, that we, prob we most certainly couldn't use it without. So that's just something to keep in mind. And within the system, we're able to do um, referrals to other programs, uh, all of it. It's, it's really handy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's my favorite thing. I geek out with it. I had a question regarding that, um, the efforts outcome. Is it something that's like it's adaptable to whatever organization and how you want it? So they're like, these like the, how you have it set up is not necessarily how maybe the system is set up. You 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 Naya has like adjusted the 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 formatting and the the flow of things to to fit your needs, right? So it's a it it kind of meets the needs of every different organization. Okay. Yeah, so it's really cool. I'm actually in the middle of doing a redesign for our program because we've grown so much that, you know, the systems we used 
a few years ago um, don't fully capture all the data now. So uh, we're able to customize it to fit what kind of information we want to capture as an agency, but also the information we need to capture for our grant reporting as well. So just a fun one. I wanted to see how much uh, technology we loan out and technology includes calculators, like really fancy ones, you know, for college, for those engineers, um, as well as laptops, uh, hotspots, those kind of things. Because I'm curious, I, I want to know, you know, how much of a need is this in the community? So that's one thing that maybe our grants didn't necessarily want recorded or needed, but it's something that informs my program in terms of like the services we offer. So it's fully customizable. It's really nice. That's why I geek out a little. I appreciate the I appreciate the in depth about about and giving that uh, example. I think it helps to for folks. But yeah, um, I think we're we're if there is no more questions, I think we're in a good place to kind of move along uh, in our session to give some space for folks. So um, thank you. Uh, so much uh, and, and thank you for uh, for joining today in our um, session on uh, special programming for youth empowerment and we would like to also thank our wonderful presenters uh, Becca and Anna, Anna and all of the amazing uh, knowledge and and best practices and just being a really great resource and helping our urban Indian programs today joining. Um, there is a, with that being said, there is a survey that we have uh, posted. It's very brief, but it helps us uh, share of what was really, what y'all enjoyed about today's session and how we can improve future sessions. So there is a QR code similar to the Padlet. If y'all wanted to just, just take that really quick it's not going to take you too long, but we just really appreciate it. And um, in addition to that, the link is in the, there is a link in the chat for this survey, so you don't have to use the QR code. Um, so wanted to give y'all a few, uh, um, like 30 seconds to at least have access to that. Um, the next thing on here, and I just wanted to kind of just share, is our upcoming events, which, um, we are really excited about sharing. So our next event is on for this series is on November 9th. Uh, and we want to also share that if y'all register for the next two events, there's going to be some really cool uh, uh, chances of winning some Nakui swag that we're going to infuse into our sessions. So keep a lookout for that. Um, or please make sure to, to sign up for that so y'all can have that opportunity. Um, November 9th is our next session. It's titled Building Program Capacity for Support of At-Risk Populations, the Role of Sanctuary, sanctuary Centers. Um, and um, the CEO of Native American Connections in Arizona, uh, Diana Yazi Devine, uh, will be presenting on all of their amazing programming around housing uh, and, and cultural services that they provide to their uh, to native populations across Arizona. So that link is also in here with other events as well from Nukui that we have if y'all want to join. Um, and um, the next slide, can we switch over please? So that really is it. That's please make sure to, 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 to take the survey. We really appreciate your time to do so and see us, see you at our next uh, session. And until then, really thank you all for such an amazing uh, time. Uh, to much. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, words can't appreciate what can't describe our gratitude. And thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. <laughs>